All right, welcome to our live broadcast this Friday. Hoping you have a are having a great day. Uh, hope that your week has been good and productive. Um, I know that mine has. It's been a great week, and we've been excited about putting on this broadcast. Um, it's a uh, exciting time for us. Uh, we've got cool things happening at Doctor Demographics. We're going into March next week. March is an exciting month for us because we have. Uh, some cool stuff happening. Uh, we call it marketing month, uh, market marketing March, which means that we have a lot of great marketing things that are coming out, and it also uh, signals the launch of this broadcast, which we'll be taking this recording and putting it on our podcast that's been running for the last seven years. Uh, weekly podcast uh, practice placement with Scott McDonald. We'll put this broadcast on there as well because we realize that there are still a lot of you that are working on Friday. You're not going to be able to make it live. Uh, however, if you can make it live, and for those that are here, if you want to uh, drop a message in the chat, um, I will do my best. Uh, we're, I'm going to have a short presentation just on a few key things that I feel is relevant for this time of year for your practice. But also, you may have a specific practice placement question. Uh, that's relevant to you and wherever you're at in the world. So feel free to use that chat, drop something in there. I'll kind of try to keep an eye on it. It's a little tough with with uh, broadcast software and and uh, PowerPoint and and all the stuff. But but in any case, I'm excited that you're here. And I want to start out talking about uh, kind of a basic thing, something we talk about all the time. And maybe I should introduce myself before I do. My name is Mike Green. I'm the owner of Doctor Demographics. Um, I have worked with uh, many, many, many of you and have been honored to help you with your practice placement decisions, helping you answer questions that frankly are hard to find sometimes, uh, to be a, a shoulder to cry on sometimes, and also be the one that tells you the truth. That's one thing that we pride ourselves in here, in, here at Dr. Demographics is we are going to tell you the truth. Uh, if the area is not great, um, from our perspective, we're going to tell you that. We don't have any other motivation or or any reason why uh, we're trying to get a commission or anything like that. So if we see a red flag in the area, we're going to tell you. And we're going to celebrate with you. If you found an area that is going to be successful for you, um, we're excited to tell you that. I love having those conversations with doctors um, when we kind of find that hidden under the radar area and to watch them thrive and make a ton of money. Uh, it's a real honor for us and something that I've had the opportunity to do over many, many years. So let's go into uh, my topic today, which is uh, five keys for practice placement. And really, these are pretty basic things, but I thought I'd kind of bring the curtain back and share with you some of the things that we evaluate when we do a practice placement report. So for those of you that are not familiar, uh, the practice viability report uh, specifically is what I'm talking about, but all of our reports, different reports, the best rights report, the marketing report, all of these have these same factors, especially when we're trying to answer the question is of, is this area viable for you? And part of that is knowing a little bit about you. What, what is it? What kind of patient are you after? Uh, what is your background? What type of services or treatments do you want to provide the community? What are you great at? What are you the best at? Because if we have that, then we can start putting that into the data, the numbers, and come out with a conclusion of whether we feel like that area is going to be successful for you or not. We've been doing this for over 30 years. We've helped thousands and thousands of practices uh, place their practice. Um, it's, it's an exciting thing to, to work in this industry because so many of you are fantastic people. So let's talk a little bit about uh, these five keys for practice placement. And again, this is scratching the surface. We'll certainly want to uh, look deeper if you have a specific area that you're uh, looking at and evaluating. But in general, these are some of the five keys that we're looking for when we're trying to make that decision. So the first key is growth. And that shouldn't come as much of a surprise. Growth is a really important factor when we're looking at the viability of an area. Because understand that you're not just going in there to work for a day or a week or, or a month. You're going there most times to be there for at least five years. That seems to be about, even if you're planning on, on flipping the practice or selling it later on, 
uh, usually about five years is where that gateway is, where you have time to recoup your investment, uh, maybe turn around a practice if you've acquired a practice, turn it around, make it profitable, and then and then resell it if that's your goal. Or you're looking to be there for 10, 15, maybe your entire career. And so it's really important for us to evaluate the growth and the economic strength of the area. And we do that historically, looking at where the area has been. And then we're also looking the best we can in a with a crystal ball i wish we had a crystal ball uh, at what the future holds for your practice and for the area so is it going to be a successful um, environment and are you going to have the right strategy uh, in place uh, to to be successful and here's an example um, there are some areas that quite frankly are not growing but they have a high housing churn is what we what we call it meaning that they have a close to 50 or above 50 percent of the households are renters sometimes that's 70 80 or 90 percent are renters and so while the area is not growing and this is something we see a lot in urban areas while the area is not growing specifically it is growing in a situation where a lot of new families are coming into town, going into those rental homes. And so you as a practitioner, you can market to a brand new family every 18 months on average. And so you have new eyeballs, new bodies that you can market your services to, even though there's not necessarily a growth happening in a traditional sense for that area. So growth can be a little tricky, but we want to make sure that whatever your strategy is in your practice matches specifically what is going to be successful in the area. Now, if we look at an area like Atlanta or Austin or Charlotte or, you know, five or six other areas, Jacksonville is another one. These are fast growing areas, meaning that there is a, a large percentage of people who are moving to the area, they're building new homes, um, building new communities, and that's a completely different strategy than an area that just has a lot of housing churn. And so it's really important for you to understand what type of growth or non-growth is happening, or is the area just dead? I mean, and that is often the case as well, uh, that there's nobody moving around, there's not a lot of rentals there. Um, maybe the vacancy number is creeping up to that 10% uh, a rate, which is kind of our benchmark. If it goes over 10%, we start to wonder why. Well, is there something going on in this community? Is that a dying community? And usually that's not the type of area that you want to be in. And so looking at those two factors gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening with the growth. And that is why growth is a key, not the only key. A lot of demographers will put 100% into growth and that definitely shouldn't be the case, but it definitely is a key when we're looking at the viability or success of your particular practice area. So the second key is proximity. Now, whenever we talk about real estate, location, location, location. I mean, you've heard that a million times. And when it comes to a practice, location is important. And it, depending on the type of practice that you open, um, really makes a difference on what your strategy should be on uh, the location. Matter of fact, I get doctors probably every day that ask me this question. Is it better to be um, in a shopping, uh, high, high traffic shopping mall or next to a, a, a really strong anchor such as a Whole Foods or Walmart or Costco um, or a school if you're an orthodontist or a, a pediatric dentist or, or someone that works with kids? Um, is that better, so much more better than having to be tucked away in kind of a back street where it's not as obvious, not on the main road? And they always want to, they're always asking me which is better. And they say, gosh, you know, I really like being near Whole Foods, but the, the price is really high. It's really expensive. And that's understandable, right? Because Whole Foods knows how much money they spend in marketing. They know how many uh, people are going to drive in there. And more importantly, the commercial real estate people or whoever the developer is or owner of that building, they know that as well. And so they know that you're going to piggyback off of the marketing of those giant retail anchor stores um, and not have to put quite as much marketing in yourself. Now, on the other side, 
you're having to explain to people. If you're on a back road somewhere or somewhere that's not obvious, you have to spend dollars in marketing in in guiding that person or that family to where it is that your practice is located. And so typically what my answer is to that question of which is better is it's sixes, frankly, because the money you'll save by going to the to less expensive spot, you're going to make up that difference in marketing. You'll have to, in most cases, to get people so they know where you're at. And yes, it's a it's going to be premium costs and expensive and overhead is expensive, but you're buying convenience. You're buying somebody else's marketing when you're place, placing your practice in those high retail areas. And for some of you, that's not an option. Either there's not any vacancy in those retail spots or um, you're just not in an area where it's just so unaffordable that there's no way that you can make it. And so that is where you need to become that marketing ninja because you are going to have to place your practice a little bit off the beaten path. And so again, so important for you to understand how to match the right strategy with the location that you choose. And so the problem comes was when those two things mix. When you say, oh, you know what, I'm going to save a whole bunch of money on my lease and and I can have whatever signage I want because I'm on this back road, um, and but then go in and not market. That's where we see dying practices because they're, they're, they're putting the wrong strategy with the practice location that they've chosen. And so you can be successful in, in either one within reason, obviously, but you can be very successful in either one, but you've got to make sure that your um, marketing strategy and you and the way that you're going to go out and visit and integrate yourself into the community matches the area that you're going to be at. So proximity location is very important and should be considered absolutely uh, when you make a practice placement decision. So key three, and this shouldn't come as any surprise, but is demographics. And really, the question that we're trying to answer is, do you want them as patients or as clients? Um, it, it's amazing how many times I talk to doctors that are at the twilight side of their career, or maybe not even twilight side, but are 10 years in, and they say, Mike, I can't handle these people anymore <laughs> i can't handle them they they're they're nothing like me and i i dread going into work every day and i on the commute there i just can't stand it and get me out of here right that's what they tell me and so that's really unfortunate and so the the better you can do at answering that question of do you want them as patients or client before you make a purchase decision the better off your lifestyle and mental health is going to be in the long run. So what am I talking about with that? So when we look at demographics, we're looking at age, income, sex, family, size, housing, status, employment, educational attainment, all the things that you consider, the typical things that you think of when it comes to demographics. You need to know that about uh, those people and really answer yourself this really important question. Do I really wanna spend 40 hours a week plus with these people for 15, 20, 30 years? Be honest with yourself in answering that question because so many times you don't. And so you go from uh, and open up a practice just because it's viable growth-wise, right? And it's viable all these other things, but then you place your practice in an area that does not match who you want. Let me give you an example. Problem is, and really it comes down to this last question, is will they buy what you're selling? Now, I have a lot of doctors that come in. Let's take a, a dentist, for example, and they say, hey, I'm a general dentist and I want to be a dental implant practice. And I want to have, you know, a cosmetic dentistry as, as my marquee, and that's how I'm going to make my money. Fantastic. Awesome. Let's a million places that you can place your practice and be successful at that strategy. But then the location they give us is what is going to be primarily Medicaid with some that that will maybe cross over into that cosmetic space. So <laughs> that doesn't match up. And so if that doctor places their practice there, with, hey, I'm going to do as least bread and butter as possible, but I'm going to focus on cosmetics. That's what all my marketing is going to say. That's what all my focus is going to be. How successful is that 
practice going to be? They will be fighting an uphill battle the whole time. And they'll call me 10 years later and say, hey, I need to do some marketing. I don't know what to do. And we'll look at their demographics and we'll say, hey, you need to change what you're offering or you need to change a practice because you can't change that demographic of people at least that quickly unless you're a, a, an area that is rapidly changing by a giant employer that moved in that, that brought a whole new uh, set of families and stuff for that area. You're not going to be able to change it. And so you can keep pounding that dental implant drum or that cosmetic dentistry drum. But the patients and the people that you're talking to and you're marketing to, it's not even in their, their realm. And so, and vice versa, frankly, you have a, a doctor that says, hey, I'm just going to have a very, very average office. I'm going to decorate it very, very average. My staff is going to be very, very average. And we're going to just be a production office. We're going to move people in and out as fast as we can. But then they place their practice in a really high end area where those, uh, uh, the public is used to being catered to everywhere they go. And so do you see the mismatch there? Now, will they be successful? I mean, if there's enough need, of course, they'll still be successful. But will they be absolutely rock star successful, really maximize the potential that they could be? They're not going to be, and they'll be pushing a rock up the hill, but the other direction, right, than what we talked about before. And so you've got to make sure that when you look at those demographics and you talk to a demographer, that you're able to say, yes, these people um, are the people that I want to be with. They're the ones that I that I uh, I know that my services or my skills or the things that, that I'm best clinically at is going to match the people um, that I'm going to be seeing all day long. That's why the demographics are so important. Key four, which really plays on this, is psychographics. Now, that word, big word, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Let me just define it really quickly. So if demographics are age, income, sex, marital status, all that stuff that we think of, psychographics are different. Psychographics are buying patterns. They're what they value. Um, what is it that they get emotional about? You know, what's, what's, their, what's their line in the sand that they absolutely won't cross, right? What, what is it that they are going to get so fired up about that they're going to say, no matter what it costs or what it does, this is going to be life-changing for me, and so this is, this is what I do. Now, that could be something religious. That could be something political. That could be something of life environment. All of those things build psychographic profiles of who the people are and really answers the question of, do they want you? Let me give you an example, something that uh, uh, is easy for a lot of people to understand. Let's, let's assume that you are, you are super excited about President Trump and you've got the bumper sticker, you've got the red hat, you've got the whole thing, right? You've got the flag, you've got all the stuff and you drop yourself in a practice just outside of Chicago. How well is that going to work for you? Now, there's going to be a segment of the market that you're going to align with and, and you can treat them, but you've got to answer the really important question of, is that going to be enough to reach your financial goals? Is that segment of the population going to be um, enough people for you, enough clients for you, enough patients for you? And that happens all the time with practices that we see. We have a doctor that places their practice in an area that is in massive conflict with their psychographic profile, uh, the doctors. It does not match up with the people that they're treating. And so, so often that conflict creates a terrible lifestyle and a terrible uh, relationship, customer service wise, because what you'll find is that your patients won't like you. And if you're in an area where um, there's a lot of competition, they're going to go find a doctor that they can better relate to because your patients and your clients want to feel like they're the good old boy, right? That they're, they're your friends, that they relate to you, that you have some of the same interests. And granted, that's a little, um, that's not awesome, right? From a business owner's perspective, that's hard to strategize, but it's so important 
when you're in this caring and healing field that most of you are in, that you're able to match that up really well, especially if your practice is going to be really public facing. So an optometrist, a general dentist, an orthodontist, all of these type of practices, a veterinarian, that are going to be dealing directly with the public. Now, if you're a, a, a specialist, if you're an endodontist, if you're a prosthodontist, something like that, and you're not doing a lot of direct to public marketing, then you can might be able to get away with it a little easier, right? Because you're relying on referrals and that's what's building your business. Um, however, even then, you'll find yourself in conflict. And again, if you have competition, that is where uh, the problems will arise, is they will go find someone that they better connect with, that they better sync up with. Now, psychographics are something that you're not going to find at your marketing company. Whoever it is that's doing your marketing for your practice probably has never heard the word before. And that is a big shame because psychographic segments are the absolute secret sauce to delivering an effective marketing campaign to the people that you're trying to reach. If I understand who my potential client or patient is on an emotional level, on a spiritual level, on a value level, now I can craft a campaign to them that they're going to immediately sync up with. If your marketing company doesn't know what a what psychographics are, but number two, what the psychographic pre, uh, segments are in the area that you're serving, then they're missing the boat. And what they're doing is they're seeing every problem as a as a nail, and all they've got is a hammer. And so they're going to do the same strategy that they're doing for you uh, in San Francisco, as they're doing for a doctor in Chicago, as they're doing for a doctor in Jacksonville, Florida, they're doing for a doctor in New York. A strategy is going to be very, very expensive because you're having to cast this wide net because you, you're you not niching down to the, again, psychographic segment of the population that you're trying to reach. There has never been a time in the history of marketing where we've been able to niche down better and easier and more cost effectively than ever before. We can look at a practice and say, okay, you've got these primary psychographic segments. You've got a top tier segment that is your, your high money earners, your executives, uh, the people that have uh, uh, the nice houses that are going to spend a lot of money in cosmetics. Then you have a segment that is more meat and potatoes. Um, and you've got this percentage of that segment that's living in your area. And then you've got this other segment that maybe are, maybe they're immigrants, maybe they're second generation immigrants. And what they're valuing is completely different, even if they all make the same amount of money, right? What they value is going to be different. And so you from a business owner or practice owner or put on the hat as marketer, you need to be thinking of how am I going to deliver a message to these people in a way that they are going to absolutely eat it up and they're going to in, instantly emotionally connect with it. And secondly, they're going to move towards purchasing or visiting your office or picking up the phone or going to your website or whatever it is that your sales funnel is. That's the key. That's the important part. So how do you get psychographics? As a side note, um, there's nobody that is invested and as deep in psychographics as Dr. Demographics. Please talk to me afterwards. I'll, I'll, you're welcome to reach out uh, through our website, phone number, email. Um, all of our reports include a, a psychographic analysis, and we're looking at that heavy when we're making recommendations. Okay, let's look at key number five. So key number five is really the non-tangibles. It's the things that are a little harder to put your finger on, the reputation, the history of the building. We all, in every town in the, in the country, there's always that one building that seems to just kind of have the stink on it. And it's really hard to, uh, to be successful in that building. And so you see a business in there every 18 months or so uh, switching out because it just is it's a badly located or maybe something really bad happened. There was a murder there or something like that. And so the, the building just has a reputation. Or maybe you're acquiring a practice that has a bad history. Maybe the doctor um, before you had done some terrible things in the community or was a really controversial figure or 
committed suicide or something like that. And so you're walking in buying a practice. You've got to understand that you're also purchasing the non-tangibles very often um, with that purchase. So when you're buying an existing practice, you need to understand what it is fully that you're purchasing. What type of, what kind of shape is the staff in? Um, are you purchasing a staff that uh, the, the, the lady at the front desk has been there for 25 years and she's mad as a wet hen that, that the doctor wrote off in the sunset in retirement and, and she's never felt like she's been appreciated and so she's going to be mean to all the patients coming in. And now you as a new doctor have walked in to a situation where you instantly have a management problem, but also you have an issue that the doctor before you has probably put off for a very long time. I have seen many practice owners that are held hostage. Uh, they just buy this new practice, but they're held hostage by the existing staff because they still have all the old habits of the old doctor, and now they're mad because they didn't get the payout, um, and, and they don't get to move to Hawaii or whatever, and now they're going to punish you, even if you're a fantastic person and great uh, clinician, uh, they're going to punish you, and they're going to punish every patient that walks through the door. I've seen practices not be successful because of that one thing, that if they had just had the guts to uh, make a decision to fire that person and to replace them, um, their practice would have thrived, but they allowed that, that person at the front desk to dictate what happened in the practice. It's a shame. That is a real shame. But that's something you've got to understand that's a non-tangible uh, for practice. Most of the time, very, very often, uh, the doctor selling is not telling the staff that he's selling. And so they'll come in Monday morning and all of a sudden they've got a new boss. From an employee's perspective, think about that. That's hard, right? That's emotionally, that's a hard thing. And so whatever you can do to mitigate that tra uh, transition and turnover is going to be really important. And if you're opening up a brand new practice, never had a practice there, again, it's really important to understand what are the non-tangibles that are happening for you and your practice and how is it that you're gonna manage through whatever that is? Is it an older building? Is it a building that has a bad history? It is, is it a dying shopping center where the anchor is gone and so you have all the smaller buildings but the giant building has been empty for a year? You've gotta understand and take all of those things into effect and how you're going to A, negotiate your lease but also how you're going to market yourself as a new practice for the area. And so again, Five keys, really basic things, but I think things that most, a lot of doctors, frankly, completely disre not disregard, but maybe don't put enough weight on when they're um, trying to make their decision. You can always visit us at drdemographics.com. We've got a lot of information there. Um, uh, give us a call if you want to, uh, to talk to me directly or, or the staff, and you can always reach out to me, Mike, at drdemographics.com. Okay. Let's let's talk specifically about a couple questions that I've gotten through email this last week as we've been uh, doing this, and then uh, uh, my friend Chad Webb's on the on the broadcast. How are you, sir? Uh, good to see you. And he's got a question. Let's take Chad's question first. So he says, "What about small towns? A more rural character and blue collar." Um, specifically, Chad, are you talking about how to market to those people, or um, or I think maybe you asked that question when we were talking about. Uh, location. Either way, let's talk about small towns for a second. Because quite frankly, the trend that's happening in nationwide since COVID is uh, people are moving out of the urban areas. It was opposite of that before uh, COVID. People, uh, younger people were trying to be close to the action, the nightlife, all the great things that are happening in the city. So people were constantly from the out of the area trying to get to that epicenter of whatever area of the country you're looking at. Now, it's opposite of that. People are looking at how do I get away from all of these people? How do I get away from, uh, especially where I, where I live, how can I move further away from uh, the epicenter? The other big thing is a lot of people are working from home. And so people don't have to live uh, and work in the city. And so they're thinking, man, you know what? I'd rather have a little bit of breathing room. I want to buy an acre or two. I want to get a cow. I want to do all, maybe not a cow, but they want to get something that they could never do in, in the city. And so they're looking at areas that are a little bit smaller, especially if they can uh, work from home. 
And so this is kind of a post-COVID phenomenon. Whereas before we had, I would say, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the doctors we worked with were looking at small towns. Now that's a much, much larger number. So let's talk about smaller towns, um, uh, blue collar areas. So there's a couple things to really look at when you're looking at small towns. Number one, you're going to want to look at the income. Is it a small town um, and it's old, meaning that it's all the old farmers who, um, you know, all the old little towns that were on Route 66 that when they built the interstate are just dying? And um, the only reason they haven't left is because they own their little shack house and that's the small area. That is... Uh, uh, very, very true for many, many small towns, especially in the Midwest. Um, definitely fall in that category. And while it might be really appealing to say, hey, you know, this little town only has 10,000 people. Um, there's lots of other little pockets of population all around it. Um, if you don't know where that town is heading, sometimes it can be really tempting to say, hey, I can, I can pop a practice right down on Main Street. There's no competition there. I'm going to just scoop everybody up. Two things you got to look at. Number one is the income thing. You got to understand what the makeup of the people that are in that area. And also the second thing you've got to understand is that most of those people are used to already driving for their services. And so they're used to going to town, a bigger town, uh, to get uh, to grocery shop. They're used to, to move, going to town for a Costco. They're used to have to driving uh, a little bit further um, because they just don't have the services in town. And so if we look at an urban area or even a suburban area, it's really hard to get people to drive, you know, 10 or 15 minutes away from their house to make a decision on where they're going to uh, visit for a practice. But in our, the more rural you get, they're already used to driving 20 minutes everywhere they go. And so that proximity becomes um, less important uh, that it's so close to them because they're already driving everywhere they go. Now, um, if you do find that uh, spot, Chad, or anybody else looking at a small town area, A, you're going to talk to us first and we're going to really look at and do a report there to know exactly what the ins and outs of that area is. But secondly, we're going to be able to look at a marketing strategy that's built on convenience. And a convenience marketing strategy is a really successful one as long as you're willing to take whatever you can get. As long as they pass the other two tests of demographically you're okay with them and psychographically you're okay with them. So they want you and you want them. As long as that's very symbiotic and you're going to be, have a good relationship there, then we hit them with a the message of convenience. And that convenience marketing play uh, works really well in a small town where everything else is inconvenient. Now, a lot of people consider a small town anything under 30,000. So usually when it gets to about 20 to 30,000, that's when we start to see uh, several other typically satellite locations from a bigger area are saying, okay, I'm going to be an opportunist and I'm going to open up a small satellite office in this you know, smaller 20,000, 30,000 uh, person town to capitalize and be the only one. And so again, we've got to evaluate, is that satellite open one day a week, one day a month, three days a week, what, what is it? So how much market share is there actually in this community? And so the other thing that's really interesting is, I, I just want to say something about blue collar. I'm 45 years old, and so I grew up in the, with the mindset that white collar made the money and blue collar uh, made less money. That is actually not the case anymore. Now we have had such an influx of white collar jobs, uh, people that are working at cubicles or in offices or whatever that are white collar jobs that are, there's so many of them and many of them don't make very much money. Blue collar on the other hand um, are your plumbers, your electricians, your entrepreneurs and they typically on average are making far more money um, than their white collar counterparts. But the strategy is different because many of those blue collar workers are not going to have the insurance that a white collar person that works for a big company is going to have. And so there's a couple strategies that work really, really well with that group. A, um, being very upfront with your pricing, very, very clear. So they don't think there's any tricks or, or uh, uh, switch and, uh, bait and switch situations or anything like that. Be very, very clear with your pricing. But second, you can do in-house plans uh, 
Chad, you could put together an in-house plan that is really well explained of exactly what it covers. And typically blue collar people will eat that up. Uh, something that's really, really popular and even something that they can offer their, their employees that won't put them out of business. And so those two strategies re work really well with blue collar. So Chad, let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of these small towns that, that you're looking at. So reach out to me and we'll, we'll chat about it. Uh, one other question I got this week, hopefully Chad, that answered your question. Uh, one other question that we got this week uh, that I think is relevant is uh, East Coast, West Coast. And they were talking specifically about some of the political polarization and how that's impacting different states. Um, and there's always the question of California. We do a tremendous amount of study in California. There are many, many doctors that are uh, looking at California. Um, outside of the world of, of uh, professional practices, uh, you know what the news is. People are leaving California. People are, are heading out, businesses and people and everything, because economically and politically, things post-COVID um, have not been great in California. But it's still California. It's still a great place to live, right? Uh, depending on, on the spot, obviously. And that's why California will always be, with the right strategy, a really great place to uh, open up a practice as long as you have the right strategy and the right expectations. Um, the government will never be your friend there. You'll always have a tremendous amount of competition wherever you go in California. Um, but the competition, I would say, and, and please don't take offense if you're a doctor in California, the marketing IQ of doctors in California is really low. I don't know why that is, but it's very rare that I find an area that is really well marketed like what I see in Phoenix or Dallas, Fort Worth or Austin or Jacksonville. Some of these other areas where the sophistication of marketing is really, really high. Um, if you're a marketing minded doctor and you want to live on the beach um, and you're willing to put up with the regulations and taxes and all those things, California can be a great place for you to practice. Now on the other side of the country, you've heard me mention Jacksonville several times. Jacksonville is an area that um, has a lot of opportunity. I really like Jacksonville. Uh, going up the coast, um, I realize it's not totally on the coast, but a Charlotteville or a Charlotte is, is really great. Raleigh is really great. There's some really great places as you drive up the coast that are tremendous opportunities. Um, and so the benefit on that side is that you are a little, it's a little bit more pro-business you're going to have more success with people that are uh, or practices that need to work with the government, but also um, the growth is happening really, really strong in those areas. So you can um, open up a practice and have a lot of new people uh, for you to treat. So, all right, I've gone seven minutes over. We're trying to keep this to a half hour. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, would love to talk to you. Let me go back to that uh, screen again. Please reach out, Mike at drdemographics.com. You can give me a call at 801-850-9393. And we're going to be doing this broadcast every week, Friday, noon, uh, noon uh, Eastern time. Uh, would love to have you join you, uh, have you join us uh, for this broadcast. Uh, again, appreciate uh, uh, those that are watching live and those that are watching in the future. Uh, visit us at drdemographics.com if we can help you out in any of your practice placement needs. Thanks.